what I've done in this book is I've revived an ancient Persian Indian legend and I've sort of modernized it because it's a story about timeless things like kindness and generosity and hospitality and immigration and welcoming people into their new homes. And frankly, it's a story that I used to tell my adult audiences on book tour very often. And every time I ended my talks by telling that story, I would sense this softness that would come over the audience. People would smile, they would sigh, they would clap their hands in delight. It was clearly a story that worked with adult audiences. And then one day I woke up and I thought, my goodness, I think I've been telling the story to the wrong audience because the people who really need to hear the story, who I imagine will truly, truly get the meaning of the story and respond to it are children. And, and that same afternoon, I sat and I wrote Sugar and Milk. Sugar and Milk begins by this young child coming to America to stay with her aunt and uncle. We don't know why. All we know is that she's terribly homesick and she has no friends in this new country. And then one day, Auntie says, let's go for a walk. And they do. And while they're walking, Auntie tells her about this ancient legend. And this is a story about how people from what used to be Persia arrived in India. So when the Persians landed in India, they were met at the seashore by this Hindu king who had absolutely no reason or no desire to give them refuge and let them in. But of course, there was a language barrier. So the story goes that the king asked one of his men to bring him an empty glass. And he proceeded to fill it all the way to the top with milk. And he pointed to it as a way of saying, look, I'm sorry, but we are full up here. We have no room for strangers. We have no room for more people to come into our country. And the story continues that the Persian leader of this expedition was a very smart and quick-witted guy. And he proceeded to take out some sugar and he dissolved it very, very carefully into that glass of milk. And then in turn, he pointed to it as a way of saying, look, if you do let us stay, not only will we not disrupt your way of life, but we will actually add sugar to it. We will sweeten it with our presence. And the story ends by the Hindu king being so moved by this gesture and by the wit of this other guy that he flings his arms open and welcomes them into the country. And I should add that this is indeed the story of my ancestors who came from Persia and were led into India almost a thousand years ago now um, as what we would today refer to as, as refugees. The book is personally important to me because as a young Parsi child growing up in India, this was a story that we all heard over and over and over again. And then of course, when I personally myself immigrated to the US, this story of, and, the, and the lesson of the story of, of contributing, of, of adding to the life of the community around you was something that I took to heart. And it sort of acted as a blueprint in my own life and how to conduct myself in my own life in America. The difference that I have seen in this country between when I came here in, as a grad student in the early 80s and the kind of welcoming country that I found, the friendliness, the hospitality, just everything that we treasure and value and love about America was on display. And frankly, that's one of the reasons why I decided to stay. I had a perfectly good life in India that I could have gone back to, but I just lost my heart to this country. Um, and what has happened in the last few years, the kind of hardening of the arteries, so to speak, uh, the hardening of people's hearts, the lashing out at immigrants. You know, it started with lashing out at illegal immigrants, but now it's like there's just something else in the air. And I thought if there was ever a moment to retell a story about kindness and goodness and the benefits that both sides get when cultures intermingle with one another, um, something that I believe in very strongly. I mean, um, I just felt like this was the right moment to tell this story. And maybe, just maybe, 
by learning something about a different culture and about a very ancient people, it might help people move forward, uh, which we absolutely need to do in this country. So Benin's Diwali had a very different origin point in that Diwali is known as the Festival of Lights and it's predominantly a Hindu holiday, although it really is celebrated, especially in India for sure. It's, you know, we were not Hindu, but we celebrated Diwali as happily as anyone else did. Because I grew up in this very secular neighborhood and this very secular city at the time. And, uh, you know, it was anytime you got a chance to party, uh, that's what you did. So Diwali has always had a special place. It's a very visually beautiful holiday also. You know, people light these beautiful little oil lamps all around their apartments on the floor or outside their apartments to usher in good luck. And as somebody who went to Catholic school in India and you know was very familiar with Christmas and celebrated Christmas even in my Zoroastrian home, um, I was struck by that. So few people in America knew about it. So I wanted to tell this old, old story, but I wanted to give it some modern relevance. And so I came up with the figure of Binny, who's just this little Indian American girl. She's going to school. Her teacher, Mr. Boomer, has asked her to tell the whole class about Diwali. And she's extremely excited to do so. She dresses in a new outfit. Her mom drives her to school. And then it's time for her to stand up before the class and tell the story. And she freezes. She just is so nervous that she loses her thought and she doesn't know how to proceed. And then she remembers the story of these little oil lamps and how Diwali itself is a holiday that celebrates the triumph of good over evil. And this gives her the courage to control her own fears and her own stage fright and stand before the class and tell this story. So it's a story within a story.